What do the ninth chapters of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel all have in common? Well, find out today on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwetz, and we're in Nehemiah chapter 9 as we continue our five-year journey through God's entire Word. If you were with us for our last study, you learned some of the important benefits that come to us when we regularly read God's Word. And we'll hear more in just a few minutes. But first, Greg Harris, president of Through the Bible, and I have a few quick updates on what's new at Through the Bible. Steve, uh, we often talk about we work in partnership. Uh, We could never do what we do, 200 languages around the world without partners. And our partners are just oozing with creativity. Yeah. They they come up with the coolest ideas, and they love through the Bible. And so uh, one of our great partners is Transil Radio India, and they came up a few years ago with something called a Bible quiz. And this yes. is a big annual uh, in- event where they pick one book of the Bible, and th- they give the listeners months to study it, and then they have to take a questionnaire. I think it's like 100 questions. Yeah. So they really have to answer in depth what is Dr. McGee's teaching. This past year, they studied the book of Hebrews, over 50,000 people yeah. participated. And and the reason is this helps uh, TWR uh, India make relationships with churches. It gets people excited about, wow, maybe I should join a home group and study more of this. And I think we have a great quote from uh, Dependra Halder is the CEO of Transworld Radio India. And he wanted to explain just directly to us about why they do the quiz. Dependra Halder says, the reason we do this quiz is to encourage as many people as possible to invest time in studying the Word of God. It's a unique opportunity to study the Word, to grow in our knowledge of God, and to have some friendly competition spurring one another on as we mature in Christ. This quiz this year was on the book of Hebrews, a book that many found as challenging as it was compelling and convicting. It is my prayer that the participants gained much more spiritually than from the prizes. I also pray that what has been learned now will not be lost in the recesses of memories, but will continue to resonate in our hearts and minds. Yeah, and and Steve, one year, a few years ago, you actually got to present the award to the national winner. Yeah, probably the biggest audience that I've ever stood before with (laughs) through the Bible, and it was full of Indian speakers for that for that thing. And this is big. Greg mentioned fifty thousand people, but what he didn't mention was it's across fourteen different languages in twenty six of twenty eight states. So it is truly a national ministry that they've got going on through their own idea of starting this Bible quiz. Yeah, and so we get great responses. So here here's a couple of them. This is from the state of Bihar. Ten children and five staff from a hostel for poor children in the state of Bihar participated in the quiz. They studied for it using a media player. The small group has now decided to continue studying the Word of God together using the media player. That is that's a home group being that, born. That's a home group yeah. that hopefully develops into two or three guys becoming pastors yeah. and more churches coming out of that. God is yeah. so good. Amen. Here's here's another one. This is from Kamir in Bihar. I did not know anything about the book of Hebrews before I started to use the study material. I began reading the book of Hebrews and then listening to the study on YouTube. Don't miss that, yeah. YouTube. This became a routine, and by his grace, I had a wonderful time writing the quiz. It has helped me to gain a much better understanding of the scriptures. Yeah, and here's another one from uh, another state, uh, Maharashtra. A pastor writes this, Our church has been participating in these quizzes for four years. The India Bible study resources are articulate yet simple at the same time. Hmm. This material is a great tool that benefits all who want to grow in Christ. It is not about passing or failing the quiz. It does not matter who wins or who gets the prizes. We are participating in it and we are learning God's word. This is our main aim in participating in the quiz. Wow. Again, it's just, <laughs> it is so cool the way they're using this creative approach to get people into the Word of God. Yes. I think we got time for one more. Yes. Here's from uh, Andhra Pradesh. I am from Hyderabad. I am just fledgling in my faith in Christ. I don't have much support in my growth in the faith. I read the Bible often, but I don't understand much of it. And that is such a yeah. common common comment. I have a great desire to study the word meaningfully. I heard about the Bible quiz and I registered for it in the nearest center to my home. It helped me study the word of God and I learned so much from the book of Hebrews. It really has been a great blessing to me in my spiritual life. Yeah, and Steve, this is, uh, like you said, the the creativity, 
the, the, getting people to say, wow, I can do this for one book. I can join a home group and do it for six books. And then I can go online and, and get an app and listen to the whole, the whole Bible. So I wish we had more time, but as always, we leave more on the table than we have time to share. Yeah. And if we've whetted your interest, be sure to sign up for our newsletter because the April newsletter has got pictures of the quizzes and more information about it. Let me pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the way people are engaging in your word in the book of Hebrews. We pray that it would continue. We pray that you would bless the ministry as this word goes out around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's study Nehemiah 9 now together on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come to the ninth chapter of Nehemiah. You will recall that I said in the study of Ezra that there were certain great ninth chapters, and they all have to do actually with revival. There's the ninth chapter of Ezra, the ninth chapter of Nehemiah, where we are today, and then the ninth chapter of Daniel. And all of these deal with this very important subject of revival. Now, probably I should qualify what we mean when we use the term revival because of the fact that, again, this is one that is, I think, greatly misunderstood today by a great many folk. And probably I should spend just the time saying a word about it. It's a technical term that means to recover life and vigor. It means to return to consciousness. And it refers to that which has life, and it ebbs away, and sometimes even to death. And then there's no vitality, and then it revives. Actually, the resurrection of Christ in the 14th chapter of Romans, verse 9, Paul says he was revived. And that is a good use of the term, you see. Now, obviously, the word revival is confined to believers. It means they were in a low spiritual condition and they were brought back to vitality and power. And here in this chapter, that's the way that we're using it. However, I'm sure that many of you have discovered that we've broadened it out in other places, and we actually mean when people are coming to Christ that that is a revival. But I think that those coming to Christ and the reviving of believers go hand in hand. They belong together. You can never have a great period of soul winning without God's people being revived. Now, we want to look at that because that's what we have here. Many of these people, as we saw in chapter 8, they had never heard the word of the Lord. They'd been in captivity 70 years. They had no access to the word of God. There was no one there to read it to them. Now, when they got back in the land and the wall was completed, Nehemiah had a great day and time of reading the Word of God. And it probably went on for quite a period, how long I do not know. And he had Ezra, who was a scribe, the one who had the Word of God, and they built a pulpit for him there by the water gate, and he read. And the people wept. Largely, they were weeping for joy. But the point was that they are bound to show emotion at the reading of the Word of God. That's my reason, candidly, friends, for wanting to get the Word of God out. It honestly is not important what I say. It is important what the Bible says. And the Spirit of God can take the Word of God, and if what we're saying is in conformity with it, and he can apply it and bless it to hearts and lives. And that's the reason we share so many of these letters, because we see what the Word of God's doing. I'm amazed at it. In fact, the matter is, no one is any more surprised than I am. When I get a letter of a certain tape we've made and somebody's turned to the Lord, I ought not to be surprised because the Lord said he'd bless his word. Now, this had a great effect upon the people at that time. Now, it led to certain things for them. They recognized how far short they had come of God's standard for them. And as we saw back in the book of Ezra, It had an effect on Ezra himself, a great concern. And there cannot be any revival apart from the Word of God. We need to recognize that. I've 
quoted this before, Dwight L. Moody said he felt the next revival that would come after his day would be a revival of the Word of God. And I wish today I could get the evangelists to pay more attention to the Word of God and not to methods or sentimental, emotional appeals or to uh, an appeal to bigness because that is not necessarily a token of revival at all. And we need to recognize that we need to have a return to the Word of God. Now notice what it did for these people. We are told here, chapter 9, verse 1 of Nehemiah, now in the 20th and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Now they confess their sins, primarily their own, and that of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one fourth part of the day and another fourth part, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Now, this reading of the Word of God caused them to confess their sins and then the iniquities of their fathers. And we today need to recognize, and I think this present generation that's been very critical of my generation, and rightly so, that now, if they are coming back to the Word of God, they are not going to be critical. They're going to start confessing how much we fail. And they'll also first confess their own sins. They're going to recognize that. You and I are in no position of confessing sins until we confess our own. And if you don't feel like you've got any sins, then my friend, you need then to come to the Word of God. Because the thing that they did, one-fourth part of the day, they read in the Bible. Then they did something about it. They confessed their sins. And that is exactly what John says. You can't bring God down to your level. There are a great many trying to do that. And you can't bring yourself up to God's level where you say that you've reached the state of perfection. Now, if you do, you deceive yourself. I didn't say that. John said that, and the Holy Spirit of God said that. Therefore, you can't bring him down, and you can't bring yourself up. If you read the Word of God, you will see that you're a sinner. And when you do... What do you do if we confess our sin? And if we do, that means to agree with God, to agree with God's Word, not attempt to rationalize or offer excuses, but call what we're doing or what we're thinking or what we have done, call it what it is, S-I-N-S, sins. And when we do that, we've confessed our sin. Now, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. And you will recall in the upper room, he washed their feet. Why? Because that's what he's doing right now at God's right hand. He's washing feet. And when you and I come to him in confession, he takes our feet. However, sometimes it's our mind. You can't walk down our streets today. Your mind gets dirty. Your eyes get dirty. Your ears get dirty. And I think sometimes even walking some of our streets, your feet get dirty and your hands get dirty. Now we go to him in confession. Now he told Simon Peter, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. Now there are great many people attempting to serve God today that have not walked in the light of the word of God. If we walk in the light, as he's in the light. And it's not how you walk, but where you walk that's important. And when you walk in the light of the word of God, you're going to see you're coming short of the glory of God. And when you do, you're going to go to him in confession. If you don't, he says, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. That is, you will have no fellowship with him. Therefore, these people spent one-fourth of the day reading the Bible, spent another fourth of the day confessing. Now, I feel very much gratified when we went through the epistle to the Romans. I don't know what it was. But I've received, I suppose, a dozen letters from folk that have confessed to me, but I'm not the one to confess to. 
but they confessed to me they'd been talking about me, and one even said that he had hated me at one time. I don't know whether I shared one of those letters with you or not, but it was a very ugly thing that he said that he'd done. Now he's confessing it. Well, he didn't need to write me about it. I personally think you ought to go to the people you talk to and get straight in there, but be that as it may, apparently the Word of God was having an effect. And if it has an effect on you, it'll cause you to go to God in confession. Now, that's what these people do. Now, friends, that's the road to revival. There's no other road. This is the way. Then we're told here that after the confession of sins, and I think it was private, I think they straightened out what they did. You remember that Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost didn't bring in revival by getting up and confessing how he had denied the Lord Jesus. And by the way, that was a private interview. Dr. Luke and Paul both tell us that he appeared to Simon Peter privately. You know why? Because that had to be straightened out. But it was a private matter. You don't take a bath in public. At least I hope you don't. They almost do it today on TV, but I don't think they ought to do it. But they're trying to sell some kind of soap that seems to be a little better. And just soap gets you clean. That's the main thing of a bath. And we go to him in confession privately. Simon Peter confessed privately. I'm sure he got straight now. But on the day of Pentecost, he pointed to that group. He said, you did it. <laughs> Man, he's not making any confession there. May I say to you that the important thing is the confession of sin privately. And it's just a wave of hysteria when you hear all this public confession of sin. That's not revival, and it certainly has not brought revival in our day. And we need to recognize that we cannot disassociate ourselves from others. And you find that Nehemiah here says that when they stood up, they confessed, and they said, we have sinned. That's the important thing to note here, that it was that kind of a confession. Now, revival, therefore, can be and should be and begins as an individual affair. A great many people have thought Finney was on the fringe of fanaticism. I used to think that, but reading him, I don't think so. He said a revival is not a miracle. He said any individual. Meet the conditions. You can draw a circle, get inside that circle. Say, Lord, begin a revival. Let it begin in this circle, and that's where it'll have to be. After all, Elijah was a one-man revival, and there have been men that have met those conditions. Now, the conditions were met for revival, and we find great blessing came, and I'm going to hit high points now in this chapter. Then stood upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua, Benai, and all this list here, and what did they do? They said to the people, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Now, friends, confession will not lead to some public demonstration where you get up and call attention to yourself and tell people what big sinner you are. And that makes you pretty big in the eyes of folk, I found out today. No, what does it make you do? Why, the people stood up after they'd made their confession, the Word of God had been read, they made their confession. They stood up and praised and exalted God. And that is the thing that we need today. We need to exalt God in our services. We need to praise Him. A friend of mine, in fact, it's Dr. Rodmark up here at the Western Baptist Seminary in Portland, was telling that in their midweek service, it got pretty boring hearing the same prayers every week. So they decided that one Wednesday night, instead of anybody praying and making a request, asking God for something or turning in a grocery list, that they just praise God. And he said, you know, it almost brought revival. Well, that's the thing that we need today. It will bring in a great revival when we begin to praise God and exalt his high and holy name. And notice what they said here. They said, thou even thou art God alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that's therein. Thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. 
Have you ever stood on the seashore and watched those great waves pound against the rocks? And has it caused you to turn to God? Have you ever stood in a forest? Here in Southern California, we don't have great forests. When I went up to Canadian Keswick and walked out into those northern woods, oh, how thrilling it was. And I went out there each morning. The vaulted ceiling of those great tall trees was my temple. And Mike had worshiped God. He's a creator. He made all those trees. He made this universe. And not only did that, Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees. Now, I'm not going over this, but they praised God because of the way that he led their fathers in the past, how he chose Abraham, how he preserved him in the land of Canaan, how he brought them as a nation out of the land of Egypt, how they were led by miracle through it, and how he took care of these people and preserved them. And they praise God for that. Have you ever thanked God that you live in this country? My grandfather, apparently on my father's side, lived in North Ireland. He was Scotch, but an orange man, and he lived in North Ireland. Well, they were fighting over there. I mean, this fighting that's been carried on in our days, nothing new. They were fighting then. My grandfather got tired of it, and he came to this country. I thank God he came to this country, and so I thank God for my grandfather, you know. Because I don't want to be over in North Ireland. Now, I don't care about how people feel about, you know, the old sod over there. You can have all of mine. You can have my four-leaf clover and everything else that's connected with it. My friend, may I say to you, have you ever thanked God that he's brought you to where you are today? Well, we ought to thank him for that. These people did. Now, they go back and also confess the sins of their people. Somebody needs to confess the sins of the country today because very candidly, none of the candidates and no political party and none of the statesmen and educators, and none of the leaders today are confessing that we've sinned. <laughs> they confess somebody else's sin, but no, they have not. And they're not confessing the sins of our country. Listen to this, verse 34 now. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, now our fathers kept thy law and are hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom and in their great goodness that thou gavest them and in the large and fat land which thou gavest them before them, neither turn they from their wicked works. Look how God has blessed this nation. Our forefathers that came to this country, all oh, they had faults and I wouldn't want to go back to the Puritan days. But I want to tell you, they certainly believed the Bible was the Word of God. They certainly, in that day, they founded this nation on morality. And you and I have got a lot to thank God for. But they sin. We sin. How much longer will God let us continue? Now he goes on to say, verse 36, Behold, we are servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we're servants in it. They recognize the judgment of God is upon them. Will the judgment of God come upon this nation? I don't think we can escape it, friends. Notice verse 37. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies, over our cattle, at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests, we seal unto it. We put our seal to it. We are turning back to you. What kind of covenant have you made with God? I hear people say the day they won't even sign a pledge to give because they might not be able to fulfill it. Well, may I say to you, you rent a house, they're sure going to make you a sign, and you borrow money, you're sure going to sign for it. I don't know why people can sign up for everything else in this life, but they're afraid to sign up with God. My friend, if you mean it, sign up with it. Oh, how many people have failed him, and he's gracious. But if we mean business with him, he means business with us. Well, we'll leave right off there, but we're going to finish next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. 
Next time, we'll conclude our study in Nehemiah and begin a new study in 2 Corinthians. Until then, you can reach us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here holding the door for you open as you hop aboard the Bible bus. We got great places to go and new things to learn every time we study. And I'm so glad we're doing this together. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Our story on the Bible bus today is just one step in a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Come along for the ride, and you'll study both the Old Testament and New Testament, discovering God's great redemption story. Is this your story, too?